I appreciate it, and I appreciate, um, uh, I'm honored that you asked me to come and talk to you. So, and um, just kind of segueing into what he just spoke with last time, one of my friends, um, he's a colleague in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, if you can't tell by the <laughs> accent. Um, <laughs> but uh, Chase had threatened, Chase Bank had threatened to debank uh, uh, because he had ivermectin on his website. So, it is, it is a real thing. Just some basic premises. Everybody's heard about the spike protein. So this was um, in the news, you know, that little ball that they'd show every night on the news with the little spike-ready things coming out of it. So the spike protein. So it's divided into two subunits. The S1 is actually the pathological subunit. So they found out early on that it did attach to receptors, ACE2 receptors in particular, and there were some additional receptors that were found, some helper proteins, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is interesting because that's why smokers did a little bit better when they got infected with um, the virus because it was actually already being blocked with their cigarettes, um, and so they didn't get... As, as ill, but you can see that the ACE2 receptors are found more often in hypertension, diabetes, and dementia, and this is why we had so many people that were sick with those comorbidity uh, issues. So ACE2 receptors are found in 72 tissues, and so this is why COVID affects so many different people in so many different ways. And you can see brain, heart, lungs, GI, uh, oral, facial, uh, tongue and so forth. Now, unfortunately, what the uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies did was out of 29 different proteins that they could have chosen from the virus, they chose the one pathological protein of spike protein to make their vaccines. I think that's just kind of funny that they all chose the exact same protein out of all 29 that they could have. So down below on the lower left-hand corner is just a representation of what the mRNA uh, encapsulated within the lipid nanoparticle, which the lipid, uh, lipid nanoparticle is also found to have problems. And then you add this polyethylene glycol to it because that kind of puts it in the whole stealth mode. It makes it a neutral um, a molecule. So then the body doesn't attack it. So if you have a positive or a neg negative molecule, then your body wants to attack it. But the polyethylene glycol makes it a neutral molecule. So then that allows it to go in stealth mode to all these different tissues. So the other thing is I want to kind of mention is not really mRNA, it's modified RNA. So if people are looking for the fraud to break that liability shield, that could possibly be one thing. Um, and then I have also the um, information up there from Pfizer. So this was their information that they had showing where the lipid nanoparticles went. And it went to every single tissue in the system. And you can see that they only cared to look at quarter of an hour, one hour, all the way up to 48 hours. And then they stopped looking. They just didn't care. So you can see that there are a lot of ones that kept on increasing, inc uh, including the ovaries, and then also the adrenal glands, and every single one of them never went to zero, and then they just stopped looking. So we know this term, long COVID, other people say long hauler, um, PASC is now a new symptom out there. So as of April, there were 762 million confirmed positive COVID cases, and one in five to one in seven people had these persistent symptoms lasting over 12 weeks. And so there's an online survey of 3,700 patients uh, that was sent out between December 2019 and uh, May of 2020, and so they found that patients had up to 203 different symptoms, and look at the average. 55.9 average symptoms in people that had long COVID, expanding over about nine organ systems. And so this is a lot of what I see in my clinic. It's just not neurology for me anymore, unfortunately. So 
loosely defined. There's not a really good definition for long COVID. So the CDC says any symptom that's uh, pr uh, prolonged over about 28 days. Now the most common things are over on the right hand side and you'll see this is why I'm so busy. So you have sensory motor symptoms, post uh, exertional malaise, memory, cognitive function, the brain fog, and then POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is basically postural dizziness when you go from sitting to standing or laying down to sitting up. You get really dizzy, your heart may, rate may go up, your blood pressure may drop, and then you get really, really sick. A lot of people took a lot of time to get uh, recovered, 35 weeks for over 91% of these patients. And the worst things were still the residual fatigue, malaise, brain fog. And then 86 would relapse whenever they were kind of stressed with either uh, physiological or psychological stressors. And then only 27% of patients are at their uh, normal working hours. And so I always tell people, this is why I can't find employees either. So, I mean, they're all sick. So now there's a term called long vax. And this was actually uh, coined in science um, in July of this year. So um, I kind of I think there could have been a better term, but I think it's better, very easy and, and it kind of um, tags on to long COVID because they actually found that even though these symptoms were very elusive, very difficult to define, they resemble, resembled long COVID. And they found that there's a lot of autoimmunity in there. So when you actually give yourself an antigen, then your body is going to produce antibodies. Well, the antibodies will start to look at other things if they're very similar, such as your joints and your muscles and your nerves. And then instead of attacking the, um, the thing that you're supposed to, then it starts to attack normal tissues. And so that's autoimmunity. The LISTEN study at Yale was only accepting long COVID at first, and now they're uh, accepting vaccine injured. And even the Ger German Minister of Health is now recognizing that there are long COVID-like symptoms after vaccination. Where can you find some of these symptoms? Over on the right-hand side, we all know about VAERS by now. Um, V-SAFE was something that was... Uh, put up by the government that when you got your COVID vaccine, you could actually uh, sign up for this. They have shut this down. And so I think they weren't happy with the numbers because 7.7 .7 sought medical care after they had their vaccine and 33% had severe adverse events. So the yellow card is basically the VAERS version in the UK. Uh, there's a article in vaccine that said there's one in 800 that suffered severe adverse events. React19.org, if you're not aware of this um, uh, uh, program, this is very, very good. Um, they are just strictly work on donations, um, and they have actually handed out more money than our government has for vaccine injuries. Um, and so you can hear all the people's stories. They do their own research. They have um, surveys, and it, it's just a really, really good organization. And then, of course, Pfizer, as of February of 2021, already knew that there are side effects associated with, you know, 12,000 reports of death allegedly um, caused by the vaccine, tens of thousands of side effects, including 23 spontaneous abortions, and over 2,000 cardiac issues. And so this is their data. Um, that is now released thanks to a um, uh, judge making them release it. So over in the upper left-hand corner, you can kind of see these bar graphs. And the one on the far left is just general symptoms. And the very next one is neuro neurological. So again, this is why I'm very, very busy in my clinic. So in the first circle uh, number here, it shows that there's about 42,000 uh, people that received their product. And over on the right-hand side, in the other red circled area, it showed that there's 93,000 adverse events that reached 2% or more over placebo. Right, so we're not even talking about what was less than 2%, you know? So this is just reported information of 2% or more over placebo. So. I have spoken for drug companies in the past. Don't shoot me. <laughs> but uh, if I were to present this information saying, hey, you know, there's about a 
you know, two and a half percent risk of uh, side effects per person, I wouldn't have been able to even walk out the door. You know, the people say, no, uh, we're, we're going to pass on this. This is one actually the patient-led research from REACT-19. It just basically reiterates what they're finding in VAERS and so forth. And so I just want to kind of give um, a shout out to the information that, that, that they actually pr produce. So one of the things that you can do, or as physicians can do, is, um, and people that out there that are looking for a physician, find someone that is COVID literate um, and make sure that they ask very specific questions. Make sure that they are curious if something has happened when the, within the past two, two and a half years, especially when the vaccines started rolling out. Whenever I hear something started in the summer of 2021, I'm going, okay, did you get your vaccines in the spring of 2021? Yes, absolutely. So, and then that you get these uh, symptoms that don't really match. You know, I have hair loss, tingling, heart palpitations, and my nose is cold. It's like, okay. <laughs> and then you have to just kind of start thinking, okay, this is going to be a, a, a global, you know, event in the body that's, that's, that's having problems. So, um, and I always tell physicians, you've got to pay attention to the review system section. In the past, you know, people would just say, oh, it's just an insurance thing. We have to have it filled out. Um, but now you have to really pay attention or create your own list. You know, Truth for Health Foundation, um, has a great list. Uh, if you write it all out, because I did, and then handed it out, it's about seven and a half pages of symptoms that I can have my patients fill out. I've now cut it down to about four and a half patient uh, pages now. The other thing that I look at is not necessarily, oh, I had an infection and then I had side effects. Now I'm seeing it as I had an infection, then vaccine, another vaccine, another infection, another booster, and then another infection. So then I'm... I, I, I'm starting to think about the accumulation of spike load. So you have spike from the infection and spike from the vaccine. So all of it together, and that's why I have the cup runneth over picture, all of it together eventually gets you to the point where everything just kind of falls off the rails. And then um, my friend, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Teresa Long, actually did the data evaluation from the DOD and said that neurological symptoms are happening in about 195 days after the vaccine. So I always kind of keep that in mind too, because six months later, people aren't putting two and two together. Oh, I have numbness of my fingers and toes. Well, when did you get the vaccine? Eight months ago. It's like, it could be the vaccine. And they look at me like I'm just, you know, no, that was eight months ago. It's like, it takes time, you know, for all of these things to happen in the human body. And then you have to be angry. You know, the patient's angry, you get angry. So you really have to just kind of watch out. The mechanism of action, not a complete list by any means. But this is how I, when I look at a patient, this is how I evaluate them. Am I looking at a direct invasion? So I talked about the receptors, the lipid nanoparticle, unfortunately, because it's wrapped up in a lipid, it then blends easily into our cells that are also wrapped in lipids. So oil likes oil, lipids like lipid. So you have direct invasion from not only the lipid nanoparticle, but also the receptors from the, from the uh, virus itself. You can easily cross the blood-brain barrier. There's several different mechanisms uh, of crossing the blood-brain barrier, so that's why you're getting a lot of the brain fog, the memory problems, and now we're also seeing neurodegenerative changes down the road. Inflammation. So whenever you have direct attack, you're going to have inflammation. Um, just an abnormal product in your body, you're going to have inflammation. That's also going to have mast cell activation, which is also kind of similar to the inflammation. Think about histamine. Histamine is the classic mast cell um, release of product. So if you have a bunch of that, then it's abnormal. It should be somewhat normal to release histamine every now and then. You get exposed to something, you're going to re release histamine, but then it go goes back down. But then the mast cell activation is that it just releases regardless if you have a trigger or not. Microclotting, and for that matter, you could also say macroclotting, which the embalmers are now seeing. But the microclotting is very, very difficult. So the little picture up there that shows the little green dots, that's actually fluorescence under microscopes. So I actually am very lucky to be working in the same town as Dr. Jordan Vaughn 
and he's done a lot of research, and I think he's the only person in the United States that, and, and anybody can send their blood to him. They have, they have a special kit that you can mail the blood to him, but he will actually have a fluorescence. Um, they'll show up this bright green uh, spots under microscope, and he will actually give it a grade of one through four as far as how bad the microclotting is. So the microclotting, the uh, macroclotting, occurs because once the spike protein gets into the endovascular system, it's almost like little razor blades and it starts tearing up the inner lining. So that in itself will actually cause clotting. And then it kind of burrows into, you know, the receptors and then, you know, then it actually uh, it causes inflammation also. And then you have fibrin and then amyloid production too associated with that mitochondrial damage so once the spike protein gets into the cell then it starts to damage little microorganelles um, and you probably remember the mitochondria from way back in biology that was your energy producer so you need to have food plus oxygen for this mitochondria to work to then produce energy for each and every cell so if you don't have that then the cell is going to die so you're going to have fatigue brain fog sleep just feeling bad and then you got biome. So Dr. Sabine Hazan, um, very, very bright um, GI doctor, she found spike protein. She was the first one that found spike protein in the stool of patients after infection and then later after vaccine. And she also found that the decrease of the bifidobacterium, a healthy GI bug, was what was really kind of driving a lot of this you know, leaky gut syndrome. So fix your gut. gut close down that as aspect for inflammation to you know keep on persisting and i have people that have now food sensitivities it's you know they've never been allergic to food and now they have food sensitivities and so forth so just briefly um this is what um this is how i think about treating each and every single one of these issues and most of my patients are going to have multiple issues so they'll have inflammation um, maybe some microclotting in the form of they, you know, get short of breath. They get sometimes even winded when I'm even talking to them in clinic. Um, and so the ones with the little uh, stars by them are the ones that I know get into the central nervous system. So um, I always try to get something that does help uh, along those lines. Um, the direct invasion, ivermectin, hands down, is my drug of choice. Um, I tell my patients what it does is it wraps itself around the spike protein and then it also blocks the receptor. So it sort of is a double whammy as far as helping uh, offset the spike protein. We don't know how long the spike protein is lingering in your system, um, especially if you've had multiple vaccines. So Tulevid is similar to ivermectin. You can actually get that online. Um, and so it's an Israeli company that has kind of, uh, kind of created something. They actually have a, their own website, Televid.com. There's a couple of places uh, like Fullscript that uh, will also sell Televid. Um, it's a little bit expensive, about $100 for a month, um, but it's always good just to have it just in case if you don't get uh, access to ivermectin. Um, there is a pharmacy in Tennessee now that's over the counter in Tennessee um, that will actually mail it to people out of state. Um, and so then the NAC, the N-acetylcysteine, I think that's one of the most important supplements because you can kind of see that I have it under the direct invasion, the inflammation, and also it helps with mitochondrial damage. So uh, N-acetylcysteine is probably one of the best things out there as far as that's concerned. Um, they have some augmented N-acetylcysteine. I have the websites down there. You can get it from both either, either website. And it has just bio, better bioavailability. Um, and then, again, decrease your inflammation. There's lots of supplements that help with that. Fix your gut with a good pro-prebiotic that does target the bifidobacterium. I mean, you can kind of see the other things that, that we utilize um, with that. So other considerations, we get viral reactivation, Epstein-Barr, CMV, HSV. We also get Lyme reactivation. So I feel like prior to COVID, I didn't have to worry about these things. But now I am seeing this as far as recurrence. So if I'm treating somebody, I just feel like I'm spinning my wheels. 
then I start looking into, okay, well, maybe they have Epstein-Barr reactivation. Um, and a lot of people don't know that they've had Epstein-Barr. We, you know, we all have positive antibodies, about 95% of us. So here's the length of time of treatment. We don't know, unfortunately. So um, the length of time for treatment um, is the, um, you know, it was found in uh, monocytes after the infection by Dr. Patterson. And then exosomes will form once you get infected or vaccinated. And exosomes are little packets of mRNA that then are encapsulated and so then they kind of are floating around the body, and those exosomes can actually go up into the vagus nerve, uh, the uh, uh, nose, the ears, you know, through the nerves, and get into the brain that way. Um, and then lately there's an article, September of 23 of this year, um, that showed that 50% of vaccinated patients are still having spike protein in their system up to as late as 187 days and they stopped the study at six months. So who knows how much longer it's going to go even after that. So, and I wrote down some of the things, um, I apologize, this is a, a rough draft slide deck, I don't know, um, I had a updated one. But uh, the spike accumulation uh, can get into the skull because the lipid nanoparticle goes into the bone marrow you have bone marrow in the skull. So it's found there and then just drops into the meninges and then further into the brain. And what happens once you get spike protein? Whole cascade of things. Not only inflammation within the brain, but then you have activation of microglia, which is the inflammatory cells. You have increased glutamate, which is the excitatory neurotransmitter, and you don't want your brain always on ex excitation. Um, and then you have decrease in glutathione, so that's why sometimes IV glutathione in infusions really, really help. Uh, the mitochondria get uh, damaged, the blood vessels get damaged, and then you start losing damage to certain pathways that then open up into tumors and so forth. Um, and then you have prion formation, which um, the amyloid, which I mentioned to earlier, spike protein will cause a, um, a your normal proteins to kind of fold upon themselves and become either inert or will start to spit out abnormal proteins. And so Dr. Seneff, Stephanie Seneff from MIT has done a great amount of work as far as looking at amyloidosis that then may lead into neurodegeneration um, as far as with, with the brain. And so these are just, um, you know, one of my patients um, on the left-hand side, she's 47 years old, and on the right-hand side is just a picture that I pulled off the internet of a normal 48-year-old brain. Um, and you can kind of see the difference. So white is space. And so you don't want, um, you know, the space here, here, here. All of that is filled with CSF fluid as opposed to, you know, that's a nice, you know, tight junction, you know, within within the brain. So she showed up um, probably about um, two years after she'd had some, um, some vaccines and then she'd also had infection. She had a seizure one month after her first vaccine and then she got a second vaccine and then had another seizure. Um, and then she came to me evaluating her seizures but then she couldn't walk. She had to have help as far as with her son to get her in, into the exam room. She was dizzy, had heart palpitations. Um, you know, she obviously had POTS, she had brain fog. Um, uh, she was hearing things, she had lost her taste and, and, and smell. So I put on a whole protocol of, you know, a lot of the items that I showed you earlier. And then she kind of got lost to follow up. And then she showed up three months later after I'd started that and I asked her you know what happened and she said that her brother had suddenly died um, he was at the gym working out and he was one of these that had the died suddenly uh, events and so um, continued with you know 
increasing all the supplements, it's, it's always a layering effect. You know, you kind of start with the basics and then you start adding and then taking away which, uh, what you think doesn't really work necessarily. So I saw her maybe about a month ago and she's about 80% better and she's able to walk on her own. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate that. Here's another lady. Um, she's 59. She's a um, nurse anesthetist. And so she came to me because she's not able to work as well. She can't think. She's thinking that she's going to mess up on the medications. She's an anesthetist. So <laughs> that's, that's a problem. So, um, you know, she came to me. And, of course, you know, she's in the medical field. So she's up to date on all of her, her vaccines and boosters and everything. And, you know, everything that you don't even need, think you need, like flu and shingles. So, um, yeah, so she's just a vaccine mess. Um, and so she, um, um, that's my, my alert. So she uh, came to me and the thing to look out, so this is, uh, let me explain what this is. This is NeuroQuant. So this is AI technology. I think it's the only AI thing that I approve of. So, um, but what it does is they have looked at all these baseline studies and now this company, uh, Cortex, is actually able to now say what is outside of the normal range. And so think of this almost like a um, uh, birth growth chart, you know, it, when you take your kids in. So uh, you always want your baby to be at 99 percentile. So her white matter is 99 percentile, but her gray ma matter is at the one percentile. Yeah. And so, you know, if you think about gray matter versus white matter, you know, cities versus highways, um, gray matter is your cities where you have all your neurons, and then the white matter are the highways connecting each one of those together. So, and all of this, I call it the sea of red, you know, so, um, and so we're still in the process of working with her, um, unfortunately, so, but. Uh, thank, thank, you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.